Merci. There we go. Good. Let's try that again. Good morning. Oh, man, you guys are great this morning. Well, so I want to start. I know Leviticus is kind of a weird book, so I want to start out this morning with a question um, that I think is helpful to all of us as we kind of dig into this book in our second week. The question I want to ask you this morning, and I'm going to give you a chance to share with the person next to you, or if you're at home, share with the person next to you. If you're at home alone, then just uh, answer right in the chat right there online. But for those of you in the room, just share with the person next to you. But the question I have for you this morning is, what in your life has helped you grow closer to God? Now, if this is your first time here ever, uh, it's okay to answer nothing so far yet. But man, get real with each other. Answer with somebody next to you, even if you're alone today. Uh, man, just share with the person next to you. On your mark, get set, go. Good. I hope, I hope that starts kind of a, a good discussion today. Um, but my guess is, in a room this size, even though we have a lot of people in this room, even more watching online, I'm guessing the most common answer in the room was not Leviticus. I'm guessing most of you did not say, the thing that has helped me grow closer to God is every time I read in Leviticus about how to sacrifice animals, every time they pour oil on somebody, every time there's all this blood and guts, it just makes my heart sing. If it does, you may need help, okay? But here's why Leviticus is so important. You see, in Genesis, we see that God creates the earth, and it is a beautiful, wonderful place where he can dwell intimately with God. And he takes Adam and Eve, and he puts them in the garden, and their role is to know God and reflect his presence to all creation and to all of humanity, really. But then Adam and Eve decide to do things their own way, and this brokenness, this sin, this rebellion enters into humanity. But it's okay because God has a plan. He chooses one man and his family, Abraham, and he says to that man, I am going to bless you, and then through you and your family, I am going to bless and restore all the nations of the earth. But then Abraham's family eventually goes into Egypt where they become slaves. Things are hard. They're being oppressed. They cry out to God, and God rescues them through, the, through a man named Moses. And he rescues the people. And if you read in Exodus, something we almost always overlook is that throughout the account, God says, I'm going to free you so that you can worship me. Moses and all the people go to this place after they're freed from Egypt called Mount Sinai where God starts to tell them that you are going to be my nation of priests and I am going to use you as a group of people to bring everyone close to you and God is giving Moses instructions on top of Mount Sinai. He's in his presence. It's awesome. He gets the Ten Commandments. As all that's going on, the people on the ground, including Aaron, Moses' brother, begin to break many of those Ten Commandments. They, they begin to worship other gods. They even make their own idol. They start engaging in revelry. Basically, it, it's really, really bad. And they, they choose once again to walk away from the God who freed them. But God graciously forgives them, and he decides that he is going to dwell among this sinful and broken people. And so, he tells, gives Moses instructions for this thing called a tabernacle. It's essentially a, a tent uh, with a kind of an outer court, an inner court, and in the, in the middle of it is this tent that is the Holy of Holies where God's presence is going to dwell among his people. 
It is always God's intention to bring us close to him. And yet Moses builds the tabernacle, God's presence come, and everything seems good, but there is a problem. You read the end of Exodus, and it's so exciting that God has finally come to dwell with his people and deal with their sin and brokenness. But here's what happens. Exodus 40, 35 through, or 34 through 35. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now at this point, Moses is probably the person on earth who is the closest to God. And even we see that Moses himself cannot enter into the tabernacle. Because you see, the core problem that Exodus ends with is that there is a holy God. And by holy, we mean completely other than. He's beautiful, he's just, his presence gives life. But the problem is, is that even in the book of Exodus, Moses sins at a point and rebels against God. And so no longer can people enter into his presence. If you would have asked the ancient Israelites in Exodus, how can you get close to God? They would have said, I don't know. Because God is so full of life and beauty and goodness if as a sinful and rebellious and selfish people we try to get close to God, we get burnt up in his presence. It's not because God is angry or he's vengeful. It's kind of like the sun. We look at the sun and it gives us, in many ways, the sun gives our planet life and beauty and goodness. But if you get too close, you get burnt up. The people were so broken and messed up, they could not enter into God's presence. And Leviticus starts And it reminds us of this problem. Look at Leviticus 1, 1. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. The whole book of Leviticus, I know it's really weird. It tells you how to kill birds. It tells you how to sacrifice animals. It's got all these blood and guts. Today we're going to read about these, this group of people called the priests. And they, they, they pour oil on them. They put weird clothing on them. And you're wondering, what is all this about? It's important to understand that as we read Leviticus, it is a journey. It is a narrative of a God who will stop at nothing to get close to us. A God who loves us so much that our sin and our brokenness and our selfishness will not get in the way of his holy, powerful, beautiful love for you and me. And yet what God has for us, he won't give it to us by force. We have to receive it by open arms. And even when his instructions sound weird or difficult or strange, we have to make the decision to follow him. So when I asked you what in your life has helped you to grow closer to God, I heard some of you share different things. I heard some of you say worship. I heard some of you say Bible reading. My guess is my kids would have said uh, vacation Bible adventure or church camp. And the, what I think a lot of you probably noticed is that your what was a who. In my life, the times when I have grown closest to God, the times when I have made progress towards Him, it's often been because of a person. One of the very first people in my life to tell me about Jesus was my youth pastor, Pastor Tom. And it was under his leadership that I made a first-time decision to follow Christ when I was 16 years old. At 17, I had a youth leader by the name of Gino who, um, contrary to his name, was not a mob boss. He uh, actually um, was just a mentor who helped me learn to teach uh, my very, very first Bible study, and it changed my life. And then after Gino, I had a guy by the name of Rob in my life that as I started to feel called into ministry, he was the one who helped me to process that through. And you see, the reality is, is that in most of our lives, when we make spiritual progress, even if it's through worship or through prayer or through reading our Bible, these things that we don't necessarily attach in our minds to people, there's usually a person behind it. It was through worship because someone in your life uh, took the initiative and followed God's lead and led you in worship. If you felt God through prayer and through scripture reading, it's often because somebody showed you how to do that first. You see, in Leviticus, there was a class of people that God essentially chose or anointed or appointed, all three words, same thing, that he said that it is your job, it is your mission and your call in life to bring other people close to me. Those people were called priests. 
And I think it would be easy for us today to read chapters 8 through 10, and we're going to read sections of it, not the whole thing, but it's really, really weird. Here's the the quick 10,000 feet overview. In Leviticus 8 through 10, God says, I'm going to set apart Aaron and his sons to bring people closer to me. And so with Aaron and his sons, they, they have them do sacrifices. They give them fancy clothes. Aaron's clothes are real fancy. They involve like tunics and, and gold chest plates and turbans. And it's all very, very weird and, and different. They do a bunch of sacrifices. They pour oil on Aaron. And it's all to anoint him, to set him out as this person who's going to help the people get closer to God. And they anoint Aaron, and at first it's amazing. God shows up in a powerful way, but then all of a sudden things go a little bit sideways. And I think as you read this passage, and I would encourage you to go home and read it, but the temptation is for you to think, well, this doesn't really apply to my life because I am not a priest. And even in our tradition, our pastors aren't called priests. We don't have priests at the district level, at the national level. No one in our denomination is called a priest. And it would be easy for all of us to say, that, well, this really doesn't apply to me. And yet, in the light of the New Testament, it refers to Jesus as our high priest, and it says that he is calling every single one of us to be part of his kingdom of priests. Let's check out 1 Peter 2, 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In this passage, Peter is talking to the entire church, and he's saying that every single one of you is supposed to be a royal priest. And so what was true of Aaron, what was true of his sons, in some sense is true of you when you make a decision to follow Jesus, the high priest. And so let's dig into chapter 8 and 10 and see what it means to be a royal priest. A priest's job first and foremost, was to be a bridge between people and God. You see, Aaron was set apart for the specific role of showing God to the people and representing also the people back to God. In one sense, Aaron was supposed to stand before the people and make them aware of God's love, his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, and he would do this through offering sacrifices. In light of the New Testament, right here in the passage in Peter we read, it says that all of us are supposed to be that kind of priest for other people. You see, if you are a follower of Christ, part of your core mission, beyond what you do for a living, before, but beyond your role as a a father or mother or sister or friend or daughter, whatever your role in life is with your family, your friends, and your occupation, your number one job is to help people connect with God and become closer to him. You see, when I first started attending church, I kind of had the misconception that there were some careers and occupations that were holy and could be used by God, and then there was kind of everybody else. For me, I thought in first place was like the missionary, especially those missionaries who are serving somewhere where you might die for your faith. Those were kind of the gold medal Christians. They were the one on the front lines winning new people to Christ and making the world a a better place and, and doing the real work of God. And then in kind of like a second place, maybe close, was maybe the lead pastors who kind of got the silver medal in the Christian life. They were the, really the ones that were pointing other people to God. It was their job to help people get closer to God. But if you're a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a janitor, work at a restaurant, then you're kind of somewhere else. And I thought maybe the bronze medal went to the person who made a lot of money and donated to person one and person two so that they could do the real work of the Lord. It didn't really matter what they did, but that was, it was just for them to support the important people in the kingdom. And yet the, the priesthood of all believers reminds us this morning that it is not one person's job to serve God in a community of faith That God can use all of our careers, all of our jobs, all of our relationships, all of our passions to serve him. Paul puts it this way in Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for humans' masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
Now, Paul here is not talking to just priests. He's not talking to just pastors. He's not talking to just people who work in the church. He's talking to people who are farmers, people who are doctors, people who are tradespeople. He's talking to people who are tax collectors. He's talking to all different people from all different walks of life. And he's not saying to make an impact for God, you need to change your career or your location or do something radical. He's saying you need to serve God right where you are at, no matter what occupation occupation you have, you can use it to serve Christ. I have friends who are teachers who make their classroom their sanctuary, who in their classroom, even though they may not have the liberty to talk about God or certainly not post their Bible verses all over their walls or lead Bible studies, they make sure that every kid who walks into the room knows that they are loved, knows that they are talented. They give them a dignity and a worth. One time, I knew someone who was a Christian teacher, and I met one of her students, and the parent told me the thing I loved about this teacher is they saw my kid and they valued him like nobody else. And that parent knew it was because that teacher was a Christian, even though the teacher didn't yell in class and give testimonies about their faith. I also had a boss one time when I worked at a construction company who he saw himself as the pastor for all the people who worked for him. I remember he would hire guys who it was kind of their last chance. They had made some mistakes. Maybe they had gotten fired from a couple of jobs in the construction field, or maybe they had made some mistakes and gotten in trouble with the law. And I remember my boss would sit down with him and say, hey, listen, I am giving you one more chance because I believe that every single per- person has a purpose in their life and God can use them, and I want to give you that opportunity to show the world that you can do a better job this time. And he would hire people that nobody else would because he believed that every single person had value and worth to offer. I also knew one time a boss who saw that one of his employees was struggling with depression and he pulled him aside and said, hey, you're not in trouble, but I'm noticing that you're going through a rough patch. And even though I've heard that you want to take your own life, I want you to know that you are valued and loved by God and that you are so valuable to this company and I can't imagine this company without you. I want to make sure we get you the help you need, but know that you have value here. I don't know what your occupation is. I know a lot of you, but I don't know everyone. But what would it look like if when you went into work on Monday morning or when you, if you work inside the home primarily, when you get up and you start getting the kids ready, what if you took the time to just realize that your number one goal with whatever your occupation is, is to be that bridge between people and God? Every single one of us are called to do that with our occupation, but it starts with us getting right with God first. You see, a priest has to be right with God in order to be that bridge. And in chapter 8, Moses has Aaron do all these sacrifices. He anoints him with oil. And after all these sacrifices, the ordination ceremony is like eight days long. It's like a really intense graduation ceremony. And at the end of it, this is what Moses says to Aaron in Leviticus 8.34. He says this, What has been done today was commanded by the Lord to make atonement for you. Now, atonement's a fancy word, and we don't use it a lot in modern English. Basically, what atonement means is kind of the removal or the cleansing away of sin. If you think of a piece of clothing that's been dirty and stained and ruined, to put it in the wash and to remove all the dirt, all the filth, everything that doesn't belong, it's that the word is atonement, this idea of the removal or washing away of sins. One easy way to understand it is just break it down and just pronounce it at one mint. This idea of going through something that makes you one with God. You see, in order to be a priest, in order to be a mentor in someone's life, you have to make sure that you are leading by example. Aaron, if you read in Exodus, he was the one who led the people in sin. He was the one who made so many mistakes in the book of Exodus. Time and time again, he sinned. To be a priest for someone else, to be a part of God's kingdom, it's not about you being perfect, it's about you being forgiven. It's about you having your sins washed clean so you can show someone else the way to encounter God yourselves. It was 
Years ago, uh, when I first bought my first house, I was, I was living in Fort Wayne at the time, and we bought our house, and when we moved in, I noticed very, very quickly that the, the sinks were stained and the toilets were stained, and they weren't that way when we, when we bought the house, but everything was getting stained. Even in the shower, you could see some kind of stain starting to develop, even just where like water had dripped. And I started to do some investigation, and people said, well, it might be because your water's hard. So I went to Lowe's and got the little test strips, and the idea is that if your water is hard, it can cause damage to your pipes and your fixtures, and you've got to fix that with a water softener. So I got one of those little strips to see if, if there was something wrong with the water in my house. And I remember red was, your water's hard, yellow, it's fine, and it was on this continuum. I remember putting my test strip in, and it came out black. And I'm sitting there trying to like match it up and it doesn't even, it's not even on the spectrum. So I'm like, okay, I think my water's hard. So I went to the store and I, I desperately wanted a water softener. They told me, oh, you got, the guy at Lowe's said you can install it yourself. So I bought the water softener. I brought it home. I got out the instruction booklet and you thought Leviticus was hard. Okay. <laughs> There were so many little pieces and all this kind of stuff. And then I saw a picture of a blowtorch and I was out, people. I was like, let me call somebody who knows what they're doing. So I called a guy. He came, and in about an hour, he just kind of, like in two minutes, he looked at the instruction booklet. It made sense to him, and then he installed it in like 30 minutes or less. Now, my guess is to achieve that level of skill, he had made a lot of mistakes. But in order for my house to experience, for me to even live there, for me to experience the goodness of water that does not burn through your pipes, to experience life as God intended in that home, I didn't need somebody who was perfect. I just needed somebody who was willing to show up. There are people in your life who God has called you to be the one to show up. That on Monday morning, they're not having a conversation with a pastor. They're not getting on YouTube and watching a sermon. They're not reading their Bible. They're not praying. But you have the opportunity through your love and your kindness to show them the very presence of God. Michael and Andy both mentioned revival earlier in this service. And if you don't know what revival is, we don't mean like just a white tent and somebody who preaches for three hours and lots of people who wave handkerchiefs and run around really fast. What we mean is a period in our lives, in our churches, and in our country where people experience the presence of God, where there is repentance, where there is wholeness, where there is healing, where people are living for God in extreme and powerful ways. And I listened to a pastor one time who went on his sabbatical to study revival movements, and when he came back, his name was John Tyson. He said, in every revival moment I've noticed, here's what I've seen, is that it starts with a holy discontent with self, then a holy discontent with church, and then a holy discontent with my society. And what he meant by that is when you have a holy discontent with yourself, it is not, I'm not talking about depression or woe is me, I'm the worst and most awful sinner who's ever lived, I hate myself, I want to die, but it's this idea like Aaron where you say to God, God set me apart, I want to be holy and completely set apart or consecrated for your will and your purpose. I know that I can go deeper with you. I want that. And you get on your knees and you pray until God sends it. And then there's a holy discontent with church. And what I mean by that is not, well, let's get mad at the pastors. Let's get mad at all the leaders. Let's look at everybody through perfectionist eyes. And once they are good enough for me, then we can have revival. No. But it's this idea that I've gone so deep with God, I want this for the people around me. And you begin serving, you begin doing, you begin wanting to see God's change. And then you get this holy discontent with society. Not this, they're sinners, they're awful, everything will be okay when everybody does what I want them to, whether they like it or not. You see, it's more like you see people who are hurting and broken and you are willing to do everything you can to let nothing stop in your way to show them the love and the blessing and the mercy of God. Because you see, revival happens when we understand that we have been called wherever we're at to be a bridge between God and people, that we set ourselves apart, that we decide to get ourselves right with God first and be the example, not because we're perfect, but because God is powerful enough to transform our hearts. And then when you do that, a priest is called to extend God's blessing to others. 
In Leviticus 9, 22 through 24, um, Aaron, this is the end result of all the sacrifices, all the rituals, all the things that seem weird to us. We have this passage that I honestly think is pretty awesome, so I want to read it to you. Then Aaron lifted his hands towards the people, and he blessed them. And having sacrificed the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offering, he stepped down. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. Look at that right there. All these rituals, all these things, they actually worked. Aaron and Moses enter into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. How amazing would it be if we saw God's presence in such an undeniable way, we felt the love and acceptance of God wash over us, wash over our church, wash over our community. And the exciting thing is, is all this happened when Moses acted as a priest and he did this thing that we don't talk about a ton in the church anymore because once again, it's one of those weird words. It says that Moses lifted his hands and blessed the people. He went into the tent and the first thing he did when he came out was he blessed them again. The word blessing is used the first time in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, and it's applied to animals and humans when God says to them, be fruitful and multiply over the earth. And it's used again when God gives humans the task of essentially taking care of his creation. The idea of blessing, to bless someone, is to give them the, uh, the abundance, the life-giving force, the joy and the hope and the peace of God himself. You see, as the church... One of our roles as a kingdom of priests is to make sure that the people, our friends, our family, and the society around us is blessed. I had the opportunity last week to go on, the, on a mission trip to Honduras through our church. If you didn't know, our church has this long-standing relationship with a network of churches in Honduras where we go on a mission trip almost every single year, and we send money, we send resources. Our leadership meets with their leadership over Zoom on a regular basis, and, and we partner together. This is the first time I've ever gotten to go, and I just want to tell you one of the things I saw and what the power what the power can look like when someone decides to be a priest and to bless those around him. During our time in one of the churches, it was called uh, uh, La Seba, and we went there, and it was, it was just a, an awesome experience. The pastor there, whose name is Alex, he's young, I think he's still in his 20s, he um, started telling his story. The very first time our church went there uh, and he met people from our church, he was a disconnected teen. But he heard that the Amer Americans were going to be there, so he showed up to meet some of them, and he became Facebook friends with them. And then he told his story how over the years he got more and more serious about God. And then he went to seminary in Guatemala where he met his wife, who's also a pastor. And they came back, took over pastoring the church. And it was awesome to see how he uses all the resources uh, not only that we've sent over, but that they've gathered themselves to really be a blessing to that neighborhood. They have a ministry center there, and it was really cool to me. It has a, around six or more rooms, and he went through and showed us all the rooms, and every single room was being used for ministry. Every single room was being used to bless people. One room, him and his wife tutor kids after school every single day to make sure that there's not a lapse in education in their community. In one of the other rooms, they teach children and young adults and even teens about the Lord. In another room, they use, and some of their other rooms they use when there was a huge hurricane and people lose their homes, the church actually opens up those rooms for people to stay. And it really, God used it to impact me because every single inch of his life was used to bless others. And so as God's priests, we are really called to go wherever he has already placed us and to use everything we have to bless others. But a priest is also accountable for living and teaching obedience to God's will. I want to read to you Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. And in this story, this is right after uh, Aaron and the priest do all these sacrifices and everybody starts worshiping God. And Moses comes out and Aaron comes out. They bless the people and all of a sudden things go a little sideways. Here's what happens. 
Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. If you read this passage through our modern eyes, it really feels like, God, what are you doing? Like, are you that vengeful and angry that they just make one mistake and you literally go from having this fire that's bringing joy and peace and happiness and showing love and acceptance and all of a sudden you just kind of redirect it and just mop the floor with these two guys who all they did was they just offered a little unauthorized fire before the Lord. What's the big deal? And commentators disagree on what the problem here is, but there's three that, things that I find Uh, pretty persuasive. One thing that is probably going on here is that Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, are trying to essentially control and manipulate God. You see, where they came from in, in Egypt, pagan religions were all about saying the right prayers, doing the right rituals, and if you did, you will control the gods because they are mean, they're vengeful, they don't love you, and so you say your prayers, you do the rituals, so that you can control and manipulate the gods into doing what they want to do. And so God's trying to say, I am holy, I'm different than those other gods. Don't come into my presence and try to manipulate me. Another problem is, is that in in this, you can see this in uh, chapter 16. Um, It says that Nadab and Abihu died because they actually tried to enter the holy of holies. Moses and Aaron were only the ones who were supposed to enter, and so they kind of took it upon themselves to go where God had not invited them, once again, kind of being arrogant. And then another possible good Aaron was, it wasn't about how good Moses was, and Nadab and Abihu wanted to offer some fire themselves so that they would get the credit, so that they would look good. And I think for all of us, as we live for God, that is one of the biggest dangers. You see, it's far too easy to take out our pen and the piece of paper that is our lives and just kind of write down all of our plans for our lives. God, this is what I want to do. This is how much money I want to make. This is what I want my life to look like. Here is my plan. So God, I love you. I'm going to put you first, and so I'm going to let you put your stamp of approval on it. Go ahead. I'm going to actually, I'll sit it over here, God, and I'll just wait for you to give your stamp of approval. I'm going to go get started. I'll come back and see if you've okayed my plans for my life. And uh, if if I see your stamp, great. Um, If not, I'll just pray more. I'll just do more. Because at the end of the day, I know what I'm doing. I think I know what's best for my life. When following God, being his royal priest is actually not about coming to God with a full sheet of paper that is your life. It's actually about coming to him with a blank sheet. And saying to God, God, whatever you want to do in my life, that's what I want to do. Because if I try to manipulate, if I try to scheme, if I try to do what is wise in my own eyes, at some point, the work of my hands, the things I do, I will realize that I have been trying to offer fire to you that was from my power and not yours. And that leads to hurt and to pain and to damage for me and for those around me. But God, I am going to wait until you tell me to walk in obedience. And no matter what that looks like, time and time again, the leaders, the priests fail, they mess up, they sin, and they keep doing sacrifices over and over again, and yet the people's hearts remain hard and unchanged. And then one man walked onto the scenes a little over 2,000 years ago, and at his baptism, and I won't go over all the details, but at his baptism, in many ways, that passage is trying to show you that there is a new high priest on the scene. And then after his death and resurrection, here's what the writer of Hebrews says about Jesus and us. This is Hebrews 10, 10 through 14. And by that will, meaning God's, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Here, the writer of Hebrews is essentially saying that the the Jewish people, the priests, are still making daily sacrifices, but they aren't changing anything. But when this priest, meaning Jesus the high priest, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. In other words, Jesus is waiting for the time when he returns and all evil, all sin will be removed and destroyed and cleansed away from our world. 
And then it ends with this, for by one sacrifice he is made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. I think for many of us, we should be more excited to live in this day and age than any other time. If you read in the Old Testament, there were some amazing times when God appeared. You can think of the parting of the Red Sea or countless miracles. You think of Jesus walking the earth, and part of me would always just love to get to be around him and see his healing, see him forgive people's sins. But the reality is, Jesus himself said, it is better if I go and sit at the right hand of the Father because I will send the Spirit. And like Peter talked about and elsewhere in the New Testament, when we make a decision to follow Christ, we become a kingdom of priests. That Jesus now works on this earth through us, moving in and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I have to be honest with you, it is a challenge to me. Because far too many times in my life, I think my life will be successful if I make enough money, if I have enough status, if I look good enough, if people think I'm talented or smart or special. And yet, we, if we measure the success of our lives by our performance, it is like drinking a poison every single day and expecting it to nourish you. Where in this passage, but also in the Old and even more in the New Testament, we see that success is measured by obedience to the will of God. And that if you decide, Lord, I want to be your holy priest, man, that will help you see your friendships and your family different. Absolutely. If you're a dad like me, you're supposed to provide for your family, and that includes food and shelter and clothing. And families and parents are supposed to provide that. Moms and dads supposed to provide those things for their family. And yet your number one job as a parent is to help your kids get closer to God. It is your vocation, no matter what it is, you, are, you have been created to use that vocation to bring the blessing and goodness of God into the world. And we need to see our faith differently as well. It's not just about getting on the heaven train so that when we know we die, we go to heaven. Although, if you ask Jesus to forgive your sins, absolutely, you can know when, you're going, when you die, you're going to be with him forever. But Christianity isn't just about getting us to heaven, it's about getting heaven down here. As Pastor Andy prayed, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we see ourselves as holy priests, we are seeing ourselves as people who right now on this earth are supposed to rule and reign, not as overlords, not as people who think we're better than anybody else, but as people who are here to serve by the power and love of God. All of us are called to help people get closer to God. One of the ways we do this at the Valley is through journey studies. Man, you can sign up for the journey study today. If you have been through the journey study, then you can lead someone through the journey study. It is an eight-week study to help you grow in your faith. We also have life groups at the Valley. And during the summer, a lot of our life groups take breaks. We still have a few on the wall, but even more importantly, what it might mean for some of you today to be a priest is to lead your first life group ever. And if you're interested in that, just go to the church website, find my email, and email me. It's just ryan.right at thevalley.church. But no matter where God is calling you, be obedient to his voice to mentor other people and to invest in those relationships where people are helping you get closer to God and where you are helping other people get close to God. A while ago, I was listening to a podcast, and they were interviewing uh, one of the producers of Elf. His name is Todd Komernicki. Elf is a Christmas movie with Will Ferrell in it, and he's actually, Todd Komernicki is a believer, and he was the producer of the movie, and somebody was interviewing him, asking him how his faith impacted his movie career, and he said, that's a hard thing for me to answer because my faith is so integrated with who I am. That's like asking me, you know, how, how does having two hands change the way you do a movie? He said, it's very, it's just been a part of who I am for so long, but the person kept pressing him, and he said, well, one of the things I do is every day when I sit down to do my job as, as, as a producer, here's the prayer I pray, or the prayer that I pray, and I, I wrote it down. I want to read it for you. Lord, I surrender this day to you, and I pray that you would empty me of myself and completely and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that the words I speak, the thoughts I think, and the deeds I do, and the words I write would be yours and not mine. Sanctify me and set me apart for your work and use me as an instrument of your divine peace. Here's my prayer challenge for you this week. 
over the next seven days, what I want you to do is before you begin your work, whatever that is, is sit down and essentially just pray to God and say, God, make me your priest. God, help me to live in such a way to reflect you to others. And for those of you that have the notes, you can get them through the app or they're on a table in the back. I've written a little prayer there to kind of get you started. And I would encourage you to, to write your own, but if you need help because you've never prayed before, just read that. Use it as an outline. Help it give you language to talk to your Father. Let me pray for us as we end today. And may God's power and presence be upon you because Jesus is our high priest and he is calling you to be his kingdom of priests. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for your goodness and your will. Lord, I pray today that my friends here today would understand that you have given every believer in Christ a holy calling. And Lord, sometimes you call us to a new step, a new career, but sometimes, Lord, you just call us to be faithful right where we are at. And so, Lord, whatever our occupation is, whatever relationships you've given us, Lord, help us to realize today that we are called to bring your blessing and your goodness and your love into the world in the way we interact with people. Lord, help us to get our hearts right first so that we may be a people who show other people how awesome our God is. Help us to follow you with reckless abandon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.